Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is your host, Willem Vanderhorst. So, I had promised before, in case you're familiar with it, to publish every other Wednesday. And for those who follow the podcast quite regularly, you may have noticed that I completely skipped the previous week. Uh, well, two weeks ago, as in during Thanksgiving. I, well, I had a couple of breakdowns with my recording schedule. I thought I would record a quick update and then... I think one thing went into another and I just directly went off to celebrate Thanksgiving and I completely didn't update the podcast. So my apologies for that. But we have a really exciting episode today instead. And that is fantastic. I had an awesome conversation with Adam Kierno, the Chief Strategy Officer at Agency Santi. And uh, I also appeared on his podcast, The Strategy Behind Everything. Some of you know from listening to the podcast that are really interested in play and games and creativity. And I talked with him about my interest in tabletop games and role-playing games and board games. The idea was to talk particularly about role-playing games, but then we just went in a few different directions. And um, I'll add the link to the show notes. Otherwise, you can uh, all the show notes will be there. We talk about it a little bit in the conversation I had with Adam, but it was a really great conversation about training into strategy. How do you come up? His transitions from working into advertising on the creative side of things to moving into strategy and then to create a book called Underthink It, a guide to strategy for everyone. So he noticed the lack of training, although I don't want to get into this. You know what? It's going to be a spoiler for the rest of the conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, But just before we go ahead, I just want to make sure I do a bit of a plug because it does make a really huge difference if you enjoy listening to this podcast that you leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or on Stitcher or wherever you listen to your podcast. Just Open your mobile app and there will probably be some kind of system to leave feedback, to give a thumbs up, to give ideally five star. And that really makes a difference if you do that. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also send me an email at Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M, at icecreamforeveryone.net. That's everything spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. And or on Twitter at IC Willem, that's the letters I-C and Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M. That's my Twitter handle. Just as it makes a hell of a difference, it's really, really hugely encouraging when I get, well, words of encouragement or just to tell me that you really enjoyed the show. Or if there's anything you think I should be improving, I'd love to hear about you too, uh, about that too, and from you, yes. And uh, all, otherwise, the list of all the episodes you can obviously find on the app that you're using right now to listen to this, I'm suspecting, I mean, or if you're listening on my website, well, then you already know that you can have the full list of episodes on www dot ice cream for everyone dot net and you can also find my weekly newsletter the ice cream sunday what else i am uh wrapping up the year it's getting colder in chicago i'm lucky enough though to be in mexico right now for this week i'm participating in a course and being on vacation at the same time and i'm it's really gorgeous so i just want to finish and wrap up this recording so i can go ahead and have fun in mexico i'm going to be wrapping up the year I'm organized, I've organized, I'm in the process of organizing another recording, but in case there's any scheduling breakdowns, because I'm going to be busy, my guest is going to be busy, so I might have one more conversation before the end of the year, before Christmas, or just a quick update to wish you a Merry Christmas, I'm not sure yet, so just stay tuned in a couple of weeks before Christmas, you'll have something from Ice Cream for Everyone, and some thoughts about what I'm planning for 2018 and for the season three of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. And um, aside from that, without further ado, here's Adam Pirano talking about strategy. Enjoy. Hey, Adam, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I almost welcomed you to your own show, but yes. thank you very much for having me. It might be like one of the things that comes up as being a podcast host to welcome I, each other. I think I'm used to just welcoming people if I'm if I'm on a call like this. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Or, thank uh, you so much for having me. I appreciate it. No, well, my pleasure. You reached out to me first. We started chatting a little bit on Twitter via Mark Pollard, I think, in the first place. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, when we were, uh, he and I were going to Chicago for an that's event. That's right, there. and I missed it, unfortunately. I couldn't make it to that event, and then we started putting together the idea of, like, uh, inviting each other on our podcast, which I thought was a fantastic idea and something that I've been wanting to do for a little while, and this is actually the first time it's uh, successfully happening, so I really thank you because you started the ball rolling. 
Oh, good. Yeah, I hope I unlock some more because I want uh, more episodes. I know you've been you've been a little slowed down with all your new stuff that you're doing, but uh, yes. more episodes, please. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm planning on it. I've got. Um, yes, I, I'm like scheduling some other stuff, and we had to reschedule a couple of times. But anyway, we're all good. We're here now, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It was awesome to be on your show to talk about games, and I'm looking forward to hearing all about you essentially. So, um, cool. I don't know if I'm that interesting, but there's, I can find some interesting things to talk about for sure. Well, if you found some of the the other episodes interesting, it's been, you know, it's, 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 you never know where it starts. And that's one of the things I appreciate as much as possible about what I'm doing is, you know, and, and I keep just trying to, uh, refine this idea of the show being about exploring what drives us and what inspires us to create essentially. And also whether it's more on the design and creative side of things or on the strategy side of things, that there is an inherent creative um, exercise also in creating a, in creating a strategy. Right? I'm right. just being redundant in the way I'm speaking. But anyway, uh, I'm sure we'll get into the meat of that a little bit more because I'm certainly interested in your perspective about how to do marketing, how to do strategy, and how to create the right, the right strategy for brands to reach people. Um, but maybe let's go from the top. And uh, I, I don't know, where do we start with you, Adam? Like, just actually quite simply, where are you from? Yeah. Um, do you want me to start with who I am now or just go back all the way to the beginning? What do you think is most relevant right now? Probably giving people a setup just for who I am, and then we'll then I'll go back in time. Sounds good. Just so people, I know uh, I'm, I'm Adam Pierno. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Santi, uh, which is a small 50-person agency based in Phoenix. Uh, and we have an office in a couple offices in California. And you probably have not heard of Santi, but we do work for some pretty big brands. We work with Pocky. We work with Delta Airlines. We work with Verizon. Uh, so you've definitely seen our the results of our work, uh, especially the strategy team that uh, we've been doing some Pretty, we've been pretty fortunate to do some pretty cool projects on the strategy side. Uh, but before, you know, starting up, I'm like you, Willem, I am a Long Island boy. I grew up in uh, Franklin Square, New York is the name of the town. I went to a really small school. I think I had under 200 kids graduated with me and then uh, went to Boston on a trip to go to a Red Sox game with like my friend and his dad just they took a bus trip i think it was like with the Kiwanis club or something like that and as soon as i got to boston we got off the bus and i said oh i got to come to college here i don't know what what i'm going to do but i want to live here so uh really? loved yeah i loved boston so i went to uh, applied to boston u and got accepted wait so how old were you at that point when you went to the trip i think i was maybe 15 or 16 and just out of just like for background, were you really into baseball as well, or that were you just going along for the ride in terms of baseball? No, I was. I was. I'm a. I'm a really big Yankees fan. Okay. Uh, so so curiously, I went to a Red Sox game and I fell in love with that with Fenway Park and the fans and the whole area, uh, and just was captivated by the city. And there was it was still early in the season, I think, so there was still a lot of college kids around uh-huh. during the trip. So I started to see like, oh, I think this is this whole town is is just full of people. Not like me yet, but oh, I could see the path of, well, of what my life would be like. And, and I've never been to Boston. I've heard great things about it, but oh, how yeah, would you, you go. compare and contrast between? I guess you knew New York beforehand, then. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a lot different. So, um, and what captured your like interest? Maybe I don't know. I think part of it was the romance too of just being away from home. I mean, it's a weird thing for people that grow up in the suburbs of New York. Because New York City is such an attraction. It's such a draw. And especially for someone I've always thought I would be somehow in advertising. I didn't really know exactly what the business was, but I loved the idea of it. It seemed like a no brainer. I'll just grow up and go to, you know, move to Manhattan or work in the city, you know, get on the train every day. But for, you know, to be something about that trip to Boston, just being away from all that, being away from home would be exciting for me. That'd be like a way to explore and find myself. And the old city, I mean, that was in t- that trip was probably in 90, whoa, 89, 90, 91, somewhere around there. I started at BU in 93. Uh, that's, the city changed so much from when I got there. I lived in Boston for 10 years. Uh, and 
it there, you know, when I got there, there was Fenway, uh, Fenway was in this area called Kenmore Square. It's like tucked back and there were punk clubs and there was still, uh, Narcissus was this big disco where I think the rumor was that there was a murder. So it was closed. And by the time I left, like a gap had opened and closed in that space. And the, the university had bought all those little bars and clubs and kind of gentrified the whole thing. And I was just back for a conference in, uh, this summer and it's a totally different city. I mean, it's, it's not quite to the level of what, what Disney did in the, in Times Square back in the nineties, but it, it's, it's much more commercialized. I was, I stayed actually in what used to be called the combat zone. And now it's like the culinary zone, maybe. I mean, there was restaurants and bars everywhere and it was, it was safe and no uh, peep shows. So the city's changed a lot, but I, I was glad to be back. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. And I, I, I noted your point about like you already knew you wanted to be in advertising. When do you remember thinking that? You know, I, I always did. Even even when I was a little kid in elementary school, I just thought there was something interesting about it. I was kind of artistic and kind of creative. You know, I got high marks in, in art class and was able to think, you know, make mental leaps uh, when I was doing art projects or doing school projects. And somehow it connected for me that, oh, those there's somebody that has to write that jingle or write that ad. Uh, and jingles were big. I grew up in the eighties and jingles were, were the point of the realm then for brands. So I, there was a point in time when I knew by heart, all the jingles that were currently airing or that had aired over a two year period, just from all the TV that I watched, which is really healthy. And, um, and just being really into it, you know, I just could, if yeah. I heard a new one, I'd be like, Ooh, I got to get this one. You know, I was like most kids with the Beatles. Uh -huh. Um, I was like jingles and I, I was, I kind of wanted to collect them Did in you? that weird way. Awesome. Did you perform your jingles with anybody? No, no, I didn't take it that far. I just knew no. them. They, it all it all existed in my head. I say perform, but I mean, you know, like tell friends or sing them on to parents or things like that. I think, yeah, probably. I think I had some friends that, that were kind of on the same page with me and kept up with it and knew knew the jingles or, or you know, we could uh, trade them like currency with each other. Oh, do you know this one? I know this one. Um, and I, I did play, uh, I still do play drums, but... Uh, no, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of heavy percussion in the uh, in those '80s jingles. Do you remember one right now, like one that's a favorite? <laughs> you know, I I off the top of my head, you, uh, on the spot, I can't call any out. Um, but when I see them, there were somebody just sent me an old commercial that was like a joke, and I think it was an AT and T commercial. And I knew the second I saw the first pixel of the spot, I was like humming it, and I was like, oh, I know this, I know exactly what this commercial is. And they awesome. sent it to me as a novelty, you know, but it just stuck in my brain. That's great. Yeah. And on the creative expression side of things, what do you think was your, was your thing or maybe still is? Because you mentioned uh, playing music, but I was wondering if it was other things, drawing, writing, playing music or. Uh, yeah, playing music was huge for me growing up, listening to music. I have two older brothers. They were really into music and, and my oldest brother, um, he just, he always had different stuff. I mean, he loved, it was the eighties, so he loved heavy metal, but he also loved George Michael and he would show up with the Larry Carlton re record and he would just always be introducing these new things. Uh, and most people have some kind of an influence like that. That's an older person that brings them the record or shows them the, you know, shows them evil dead for the first time. And they say, Oh, well, I haven't been exposed to that. And for me with music, it was him. There's a million different sources of a million different types of music and, and uh even now if you look at my playlist now i think I, that influence stuck with me uh, and and i think it that's an important part of being in marketing is having a wide breadth of awareness of categories and different styles not necessarily because you want to ape them but if all you've ever listened to your whole life is metallica it's kind of hard for your brain to imagine a world outside of, you know, 30 second notes. You, you yes. have to be able to think, oh, no, we're going to think about this. This is like this is more like jazz or this is more like that. Um, so being exposed to art and being exposed to different voices, which is why people love the Internet, which is why I love Twitter, which is why my kids love YouTube. They, they love to just jump from weird topic to weird topic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. How old are your children? Uh, seven and nine. Yeah, my daughter's nine and my boy James is uh, seven. 
and they're both like actually I'm interested I, I guess this is a strategist starting asking questions but oh yeah do it yeah. how do they uh, go on to YouTube most of the time what are they, they used for that? their their uncle my my uh, wife's brother brought them tablets uh as a gift when he, we didn't, he lived in uh, Atlanta when we moved back as uh-huh. a gift, he came and showed up with these tablets and was kind of like, Oh, was I supposed to ask you guys as he's opening them up and giving it to the people? So we actually, we took away YouTube, uh, about six months ago. Cause we started seeing some weird videos and I, have you actually, I just saw an article two weeks ago about there's these creepy, weird algorithmic videos that, uh, have been created and added to the YouTube kids have you seen this? You no, know what I'm talking no, about? no, no, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. What I'll send it? you a link. I'll send yeah, you a yeah. link so you can add it to the show notes. Yes, there, there's yes. this whole, so someone did a story and went into the YouTube kids uh, platform and just started watching all the, you know, if recommended, if you like type videos. Huh. And it's, it looks like a kid's video when you start. So it'll be like a character like, uh, like Elsa from, um, frozen but then she's like bound and gagged or it's like elsa at the dentist office and they're yanking her teeth out What's and some of them see, they're, they're sick yeah and some of them are kind of cartoony but some of them are real people and you're, you're you you can't get your head around who how they're created or who did it but they're if you've ever read the book um oh man what's his name the book is called flicker uh, it's by theodore raw Rorschach, i think is his name and i'll send uh-huh. you a link to that too yeah, I'll make sure it's in the it's about how media undermines uh, people. And that's a novel. That's a fictionalized version. But you start to see these subliminal messages that are coming up. And we think it's algorithmically, but I don't know. Wow. Shit, I, it's just scary stuff. That is. That is really strange. It sounds like a, a topic for an episode of Reply All. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I am I would be surprised if they weren't already working on it, knowing those guys. It's right up their alley. You're right. Yeah. All right. Um so, and then on the music side of things, so you were the drums the first instrument you started playing? Yeah, it's the only instrument I've ever played. I can't do anything else. I mean, when did you I, start? as a kid. Yeah. Oh, like, I don't know, like 11 or 12. I had a really good friend who played guitar, and he was a very, very, very good guitar player. And so we used to play together, and I just saved up money from working jobs and went and bought a kit. Um, you know, and I just kept adding to it. So I was kind of plugged in that way that I had, it always helps when you have someone to, to do it with, right? Anything you're going to do, uh, have someone that you can go alongside with. Uh, so yeah, so always played and, uh, try to keep up with it. Even now I still play, but um, not as, not as much as I'd like, but, uh, sure. more than, more than my wife enjoys. I, <laughs> did you play across styles and genres or, you know, what? You it's start mostly with heavy metal or, no, I don't play. I don't play metal. I can't play as fast as I used to play for right. sure. I'm an I'm an old man now, <laughs> um, and I don't. I just don't get to play as much as I want. You have to really stay up on it to keep that that tempo. Um, somebody once said that every rock song, every metal song, is like running a mile. Um, I don't know about that, but no, I play. I play slower. Still rock stuff, you know. Yeah. Cool. All right, and so that that takes us like we were talking about. You knew you wanted to study advertising, and you wanted to go to Boston, and that's basically what you did, right? That's exactly what I did, but I didn't. So I went to BU. I got in, and they had a program that was this focused uh, humanities program. It was called the Core Curriculum, and they still do it. Um, I think I was one of the first couple classes. I wasn't the very first. But it was all this exposure to literature and uh, philosophy and all these things that it just had, my my world was so not open to that. It's just not mm. the kind of household I grew up in to be talking about that. And so I lit up. Uh, I did that for two years and I loved it. And that's that curriculum is a two year curriculum for kids to kind of come in and find themselves, figure out where you want to go. Uh, I loved every minute of that, although it was a lot of work. And then you. Um, from there, I transferred into the communication school and moved into the advertising program there, which is was a really good um, ad program, still is, really strong, and, and was really lucky. I, my first class was with Alan Holiday, who founded, one of the founders of Hill Holiday, and that guy was just an open book. You know, he just, he ended up being my advisor and just, to, just lucky to go hang out with him and his door was always open. So it, it really helps to have... Um, and I try to do this with, with younger people. It's, it really helps to have someone just to go ask questions and that'll actually not be annoyed that you walked into their office and we'll make time for you, which in the strategy world, I, I don't know 
we're a small agency, but I don't know at big agencies what that kind of access is like. You know, if people have that for not necessarily even a mentor, it's just somebody to go, hey, I'm dealing with this. What do I do? Yeah. That exists for creative people for sure uh, on the, you know, art directors and copywriters and developers, but I don't know if it exists for strategy. Yeah. I think it's a very good point. And I think it, I mean, I'm not sure, I know, but just from the experience of having been to a few different agencies, the best I can say is it depends. Yeah, well, that's true. That's that's true. Um, you someplace have a better program or just people that are more receptive to it than others. Yeah, or people either more receptive or more available altogether. Yeah, um, well, that's true, too. I mean, especially at the senior level, sometimes people just don't have time. They, they exactly. love the idea of it, but it's just they're billable and they're running from thing to thing. Exactly. So that I have been in places where, you know, the CSO is just never there. So, and they, and if they are there, they're totally, the doors open and they're available, but they're just, they're traveling all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're just going from client to client. Yeah. Yeah. Putting out fires. Yes, exactly. All right. And, um, so this is always something that I found interesting and I'm not talked about with too many people, but I'm interested in your, perspective of uh, particularly now that you're also as you said uh, you know making sure that you make time for other people and younger people and i know that we, we mentioned mark quickly and that's something that you're doing now and I'm, i'll be looking forward to talking about the, the the training side of things that you've been working yeah. on but to start with on training and education i know people who've gone through curriculums and advertising and studied it in college or university and some people who haven't so what's your percep- perception on, is it worth or should people be going through an advertising curriculum to be working in advertising? Or, I don't know, just like this kind of an open question on what your perspective yeah. of education in advertising and marketing is. It's a good, It's this is the right time to have that conversation more broadly because when I when I went to school and I graduated with a degree in advertising, or marketing with a concentration in advertising, mm. I actually thought, oh, I, I, a year in, I thought, oh, I wasted my time. I didn't, I put together a portfolio on my own. I came out as a creative, you know, I got into the business as an art director and I thought, oh, I wasted my time learning those things I, or I didn't need to learn those things. I could have been an English major, for example, and still put together a portfolio. And then as I moved up, uh, in my, in my career and I became a, a senior art director, a uh, uh, CD that was hiring creative people, the ad schools had started. And they they started in the late 90s, I think, Minneapolis ad school started. And so I was exposed to those kinds of books first as competition for jobs or for projects. And I saw those young people coming out that were the same age as me. And then as a hiring manager, I would get portfolios from them. And I haven't actually been plugged in recently enough. So I would love perspectives on this as, as looking at just creative personnel. There's something cool about the idea of people that are like, you know, a year and a half, two years of immersing themselves and really thinking about the craft. But my experience with them is that they come out and they're spinning like a top. And a lot of times you have to, you have to grab them by the shoulders and say, okay, that was great, but now we're here and it's business and we have to do some, we have to do some, this, we have to do this with some rigor. We have to have some discipline around it. And it's not just creating ideas all the time. And that's the part that I felt was missing when I was managing art directors and copywriters. Um, but now I don't know how the schools have surely evolved since the, in the, in the couple of years that I've been on the strategy side and not really, we, I don't think we have any, ad school people here, maybe one copywriter. Um, so I don't see how much the changes happen and what that's done to the personnel. So you, you probably have more exposure to it at your shop or you just have more people. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I, but it's not a conversation. I'm just thinking about it now. It's not a conversation yeah, I've yeah, had yeah. with too many people, but I know, I think that oh, it's here, an interesting, a lot it's of a really the people coming topic. in are coming from uh, marketing and advertising curriculums, I think. Right. At university At or university, from ad I think not necessarily at school. I'm talking about what I've come across as a generality, so I'm probably stereotyping completely. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, this is the impression I have rather than actually based on research. <laughs> no, we got to <laughs> right start now. somewhere, right? Yes, exactly. But I think it's a very interesting topic for sure. Uh, we'll keep exploring well, that one. Y- yeah, and I also think I wonder if. Everything that I do today when I'm thinking about strategy, I mean, none of there was none of this stuff existed when I was in school earning my degree. Yes. The, the, the 
conflicts I deal with and the strategic challenges are from platforms and even, you know, whole technologies. I mean, the internet existed in quotes, but it didn't exist like it exists today. It's not, now it's, you can't wake up without the internet. I mean, you really, you really are shut out. So it's hard. I can't reasonably critique the education I got, but I look back at it and I say, okay, some of the foundations and that's in the book, uh, in my book, it's about, Hey, let's go back. Let's jump over the internet and let's think about just the core principles of strategy. Those core principles are still as valuable today as they were, especially when we actually slow down and use them. Right. Yes. But the, the, the idea, I, maybe it's more media strategy that has, has blown up and been rebuilt and been rebooted 17 times since I graduated college in the, in the late nineties. Well, actually, let, let's maybe talk a little bit about your book. And as an opportunity, perhaps, for anybody listening, let's say, who's not as familiar about marketing and advertising and branding and strategy, your book might be a good place to start. So it's called Underthink, Underthink It? or Underthink Yeah, under, Underthink, yeah, it. Under, underthink right. it. Yep, it's called Underthink It, uh, a marketing strategy guide for everyone. And the book itself, it came about, uh, I was challenged to, so I came up on the creative side, then I was really lucky to get this job as in strategy leadership. And um, how did you want to, did it, did it just happen or did you consciously want to move from being on the creative side to the strategy side that are different departments? Of in, in no, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot different world. Uh, when I was a CD here, so I, I'm at uh, Santi is the name of the company. Creative and, director uh, for people, by the way. Just... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I got hired at Santi in 2007 as a creative director. And I was really lucky. We had a killer media director and a really strong account director, but we had no planner and we couldn't, we didn't have the revenue to have a strategy department or a account planning department. So the three of us on a lot of business put our heads together and became that. Uh, then I, I left, I moved to Atlanta to try to open a shop there, um, or support, a uh, a shop there. And when we were in Atlanta after two years, my wife and I, she, she's, my wife, Amy is from, uh, Scottsdale and, you know, she was kind of homesick. She wanted to move back. I called Dan Santee, who's the founder and CEO of Santee. And we had always stayed in touch, uh, when I left and he said, Hey, I, I would love it if you would come back. I'm rebuilding. I'm changing everything we're doing. And I was like, oh, that's perfect because I would love to come back. And he said, but I don't need a creative director. And the funny thing, when he said it, it was again, it was another one of those moments where the light bulb just turns on. And I was so happy, you know, and I was just thinking, wow, I can't even believe I don't want to do that job. So this is amazing coincidence. So what we agreed to do, um, I said, hey, you know what? You write a job description for the, the person you need at the company. What do you, what's the business card you think is missing on the table when you go to a meeting? And I'll write the job description that I think I can do that I want to do. And it was almost, you know, I'm, I'm showing Willem here on the camera, a Venn diagram here. And it was so closely aligned. It was amazing. That's awesome. And that's, that's the job it was. I came in as strategy director. Uh, and so that actually was the foundation of the book after... I've been doing this for four years. We've got a growing team. Uh, there's four of us now and some more people coming on. We've really built out the practice. And they said uh, in my review, I was, I was challenged. Hey, how come you haven't really trained your team? And I thought, I said, okay, that's reasonable. And then I thought, well, I, I guess because I've never been trained. So I was, you know, I came through BU, but after that, it was figuring out as we go. And a lot of the job, well, you know this, a lot of the job is actually just that. It's it's MacGyver time. It's let's yeah. get the duct tape and here's the tools I have. Mm -hmm. So I started to, I said, you know what? I, you, this is fair. This is reasonable. I got to train. I have to help train my team. So I started looking up different training courses and I thought I was kind of being lazy. I Googled it and I thought I'll find some, I'll send them to Stratfest and that'll solve it. Right. I'll, I'll find some comprehensive thing that I could just send them to and they'll come back and they'll be trained. Yes. Be done. But I couldn't find it. And so you mentioned Mark Pollard and I asked him, I asked a bunch of strategists from around the country, a lot of them through Twitter. Hey, how do you train your team? And they all came back and said, when you find it, send it my way. I need it. We need to train our team and we don't have a resource. Yeah. So I kept looking, but as I was doing it, I was bookmarking things and taking notes. 
And what I ended up doing was I had created a curriculum. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but by the time I was done, I had this 30 page Google doc that was a curriculum and it really turned into the outline for the book. Uh, and I call it under thick, under think it because it's really just about getting back to basics. And if, we, if we, what questions do we ask at the top when a client comes to us and you, you live this too. So a client will come to you and say, Hey, we want to do a, a new website or we want an app. And it's our job on the strategy team to say, hold on. Number one, what's the, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Is the problem that you're trying to solve that you want to have an app or is there a business problem? You want more increased lifetime value or, you know, more custom, customer acquisition or do you tell me, you know, the, the next question is what is the desired outcome? And then, then finally, what are the constraints? You know, what are the ropes around the ring? And I actually have a sticky note, which I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. uh, that I keep on my desk with those questions so that anytime we start a project, that's where we start. And that's, that's in the book. I think it's in chapter one and that's not, that's not bullshit. That's, that's the whole job. It's yes. really just before the, before we re started recording, you mentioned uh, Socratic method and that's the whole job is just asking questions and mm -hmm. using the five whys to get to the core of the problem. Yes, absolutely. And it's one of the things I love about, the job of the craft, I guess, it's infinitely variable, and it's actually what is what is it? it's it, it's pretty simple. It's not necessarily that easy, but it's actually very simple. Right, right, yeah. That's that's a great way to say it, uh, and that that's what the book is. It's not meant to be. People can read it. I think it's pretty breezy. It's 150 pages, and it's it's designed to be really airy and not very dense. What I've found is talking to people in strategy or trying to as an outsider trying to plug into it or get access to strategic minds, there's so much jargon. There's so many big words and it's because it's really smart people. You know, the thought leaders especially are just really smart people. We're all borrowing terms or ideas from academia. So we're, we're looking at college studies or published papers from schools and from psychology and economy. And so we steal these words. So on one side, it's, it's, the, the source material has these huge words. On the other side, we're trying to sound smart. No, make no mistake, my ego, I want people to think I'm smart, right? It hurts my feelings if they don't. And then on the other side, agencies want to have a proprietary process, right? Yes. Well, I have our, this is our 360 brand wheel. It's like, good, give me a break, guys. It's the same goddamn process, you, you right? It's what are the characteristics of the brands? It's the same stuff in every single one. So it becomes this impenetrable, see, that's, even that's a big word. It becomes this lake of bullshit that you can't swim through when it can just be all small words. So in the book, what I had the editors do was when they find a word like impenetrable that I just used, I had them use strike through text to call me out. So they kept the word in there and then they replaced it with a better word or phrase to keep it simpler and to keep it under thought. Just to like, hey, let's make this really simple um, not because I don't think that people reading can understand it, but to make the point, uh, again, Mark Pollard is the guy that showed me, I've heard him say small words, say more. Yes. And I didn't, I had heard that after the book was published, but I was, it's, yes, amen. I totally agree. We can get so much further when people actually understand the strategy versus we stand up there with 90 slides of jargon. Nobody, ever, nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, just to mention, I'll, I'll, as we're mentioning Mark, I I, uh, I did meet him and record a conversation back in London, uh, but the sound and the audio just went wrong, and so we'll, I just, we we still have yet to reschedule another one. So <laughs> it was not it was not published, and I just have to reorganize that conversation with him. At some between point. the between the two of your schedules, I'm not I'm not too surprised. <laughs> Plus. Plus his accent, you know, makes him kind of hard to understand. That's exactly why. It's because of his accent. Nothing to do <laughs> with the fact that I was like, it's the first time I was using my recorder in months. And anyway. Uh, oh, was it just total technical error? Yeah, it was It was technical error. But, uh, but I, I, I find it funny to call it because it's his accent. I'll tell him to listen to this. <laughs> yeah, oh, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll text him. He's him Australian now. for the people who don't know, by the way. Yeah. Um, he actually is a little sensitive about that accent sometimes. <laughs> Great. Well, so so you got the book, and um, and that was recorded through a, a lot of your methodologies. And I understand that you started at what point did you start? Because you started a training workshop yourself. 
Yeah, right around the same time. So mm-hmm. we started doing, it's called Instill Strategy, uh, and it's a product of Santi. So I do it through the office. It's not like a, a side hustle or whatever. Okay. But um, what we found, you know, going back to mid-2000s, nobody knows who Santi is. You know, if we're not a, we're not a, a household brand agency like the Drogas and the DDBs and the uh, BBDOs of the world. But people have been coming to us for strategic services. Uh, And so big, big agencies at our household names have had us white label strategy going back to 2009, 2010. That's a service we still sell. uh, And we're totally happy to do strategy work and put it in their deck or put it in a neutral deck and let them just take all the credit for it. And we're fine with that. So as I was putting together that curriculum that I mentioned, or, or the Google Doc is really what it was, And starting to think, I started to see the pattern of, hey, well, if we need this and there's only four of us and nobody knows how to train their team, then there must be a need for this kind of curriculum if I could get it out to the world. And so really just kind of formalize it, put together some real, real simple training materials and um, started shopping that product and agency. the, The response has been really, really strong. People People seem to want it, seem to need it, and it's just uh, getting calls every now and then for people that want a quick training course. It's, it's been uh, interesting, and it's been fun to watch people react to it. That's great. That's very cool. And so the, the courses that you offer are typically mostly for strategy teams or for marketing teams and clients or anybody in agencies, or does it depend? Or? It's designed for account execs and younger strategy folks. I think if you were a senior-level strategy folk, this strategy folk. If you were a senior level strategy person, you probably there's material that's useful in there, and there's material that's a good reminder. But you know, if you were doing a day long course or a two day long course, there'd be a lot of stuff that'd be uh, you, you'd kind of already know this stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's designed for non strategy people to, to to understand it. So the way it usually works, I mean, we've done trainings for in house for brands. Uh, go in there and train their marketing team. We've gone in there. We've gone into agencies and trained a cross-functional. So some creative people, some agency, some uh, account executives, and some strategy people. And then we've done uh, some stuff was really talking to strategy people and cutting out some of the real basic stuff. Mm. Because more and more, if you think about um, agencies my size, not agencies your size, but you know, seventy people and under, they may not have a CSO, and they may not, they may not even have planning. Yeah. So the account team, a lot of times, or the media team, it, those jobs, the the work that still needs to happen falls on other people. That it's really not their discipline. Once upon a time, uh, the account team. I was at Hill Holiday when they got planning. Before planning showed up there, it was the account team's job to write all the briefs and to do that research. And now that that's kind of been transferred. At the biggest shops, have a planning department or a strategy department, but for 30 people, 50 people, man, a lot of them just don't have a planner. They don't have a strategy person or they outsource it to agencies like ours. And amen, we'll take that, those projects. We love it. And we love partnering with agencies, but those people need training. And that, that means the account team need somebody on the strategy side to make them competitive. Because one of the big problems is that on the client side, you're talking to an MBA. They don't suffer fools when they're talking to someone who doesn't speak the language or can't quickly jump through the hoops and understand the the concept or where they're trying to go. It it's really a an uphill battle every single day for an account exec or for a young strategy person that that hasn't been trained in this stuff to go in there and sit across the table and have a good conversation and earn confidence, earn trust from that client who is an MBA. Yeah. And do you find it's interesting and maybe not because you've been talking about doing strategy work for other agencies, but of course, advertising agencies can be very competitive with each other. So the fact that Senti and your agency is providing those services, do you find that to be a barrier to sell the the training workshops, for example? Yeah, no, it is. It is. I've get I got a lot of notes from people that say, "Hey, I'm really, I would love to do this, but we can't. We can't hire an agency to come train our agency." Right. And there's a lot now. I I think when I when it was founded, it was it tapped into something as a need, mm-hmm. um, and then a lot of independent. Uh, I shouldn't say independent, but a lot of other people came up with a similar idea. So there's a lot of services right now where people are are trying to do the same thing. And I've I've been talking to most of those 
or many of those people that do that. And I think it's great. I don't care. You know, maybe they're competitors, but I don't really care. I think if you need training, um, call me. And if you can't hire me or you can't hire Santi to do it, I will connect you with an independent agency or an independent person to come do it because yeah. investing in your talent and investing in your, your education, whatever that is, that's how, that's how one, you know, the work gets better. That's the main thing I care about. Yeah. When clients can actually understand what the hell you're telling them, it goes a lot further when they can bring it up to their boss and say, I understand this and I can present it to you with confidence versus I don't know what this word is on slide 81, but trust me, this guy had glasses on and he sounded really smart. Yes. I think you know? it's great. I, I mean, I absolutely agree that investing in people's education in makes the work better. And that's one of the things that is or can be lacking occasionally. At the very least. Yeah. I mean, it's never, the work is never good enough. Hmm. A couple of other topics I had in mind uh, that I just briefly looked through, you know, uh, browsing your LinkedIn, and that might lead to a couple of other things. But I noticed some work you were doing or are doing for uh, food and restaurant marketing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, one of our – here at Santee, we have two real uh, specialty areas, uh, restaurant, multi-unit restaurant. Okay. And then CPG food are two focus areas. So we have a content site that we created called food and restaurant marketing dot uh-huh. com. Very inventive name. Uh, <laughs> we were very deliberate with making it just a crystal clear name. And then out of that, um, we have a podcast called the Food and Restaurant Marketing Podcast that I host where I talk. It's mostly uh, Dan, Santi, and I from here. And then every other episode has a guest from a brand yeah. uh, where we talk about you know what they they can't come on unless they have a topic they're passionate about. And it's really about how they approach solving that problem. And we talk strategy, but it's all in the context of that restaurant or uh, of their particular focus area, their expertise. So it it gets a little bit, if you're not a restaurant marketer, it's gets, sometimes it can get a little bit inside baseball, but Hmm. it's for that unique audience. Well, I might have a, well, I don't know if that extends or not, but I might have a guess. The reason why I was asking this, not only, I mean, I'm French and I love food and wine and and I mentioned in a few of my episodes, uh, or I mean, if you haven't heard, it doesn't matter. But my brother, both my brothers are chefs. Oh, yeah. And my elder brother, who's worked a lot in the business and now transitioned over to the hospitality and hotels. But we had a lot of conversations and he was always very fascinated with the new or more recent trend of multi-unit branded restaurants uh, that have themes and that are usually I mean, more and more taken over by groups that are that plan them in advance that open like not one but four or five in one go right and uh and like if you go to london and many increasing amount of cities in the states the center of london is just completely taken over by these chains right that are yeah. doing things very well and i think it's it's just a very very interesting area and i'm always divided and split between being impressed that they're doing a really good job of the food and their branding and uh, what they look like and everything else. And like a little bit saddened to see that there's less independent yeah, restaurants that are family owned, etc. I agree. There's a, there's a uh, group here. There's a entrepreneur named Sam Fox here in, in Phoenix that has, I don't know how many restaurants he has, but I don't know how many locations he has, but he has, he's built Instead of building Sam Fox's place and making 50 of them, he's got eight, nine, ten different brands that he slowly stamps out. So you could go to the pizza place, you could go to the, you know, this place, you can go to that place. And so it doesn't feel like TGI Fridays um, until you start realizing, I mean, it never feels like Fridays, thank God, but it, it doesn't, eventually you realize, oh, these are all connected, you know, all these brands are related to each other. But the... It's really, to me, it's captivating, um, and I would love to talk to your brother. Uh, it's captivating to me that the the meeting of the McDonald's kind of standardization and then somebody who finally said, although McDonald's started with good food, but somebody in this millennium that finally said, oh, no, people demand really good food. Like Chipotle, you know, say what you will. I know they're having their problems. That food is good. Yeah. It doesn't feel like fast food, even though it's served pretty quickly. Uh, so it's really cool to see brands that are getting it and saying, no, people actually don't just want slop on a face, on a plate in a value meal. That strategically, they came to that place where they said, oh, no, we're going to serve killer food, but yeah. we're going to do it fast or we're going to yeah. do it in a standard way that people understand. Yes. It. And that's some of the stuff that my brother's been working on that he'd be very interesting, which was how to. So because he worked in a 
you know, high-end gastronomy, Michelin star, he's earned Michelin stars, and he was on that race to earn three, which he, he didn't get to three, but wow. which was a very different environment that to then move on and be interested in, okay, but how do you do really good food, simple food, and how do you scale it, and how do you keep it standardized, and but how do you do, like, the standardization, like the dream of McDonald's, but with really good food, locally sourced, et cetera? That's the holy grail. Yes. That's the holy grail. I mean, that's what you've seen even – the uh, craft of the world, uh, Tom Colicchio trying to roll out more and more craft locations and just saying, it's too big. Moving on now, here's my new concept. Yeah. Cause there, there is a limit, especially if you want to go out of, you know, you mentioned those brands in London. When you're all in one space, geography is your friend, you know, and saturation is your friend. And then so your supply chain is all going to one place. But if you wanted to open in the U.S. where it's so much more sprawling, that's a real challenge, you yes. know, to be in, oh, we're going to start in Phoenix, but then our next one's going to be in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, consistency is going to break down fast. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard. Good. Well, it's really, this is a really, really interesting topic. Well, I guess I'll segue into just slowing down and completing and going into the cool down questions with something around. So you, sounds like you have worked on, well, actually, before we get there, I do want to ask you about when you started your podcast and like both of them. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, so actually, yeah, well, well, how do you start this podcast? Well, your podcast, not this podcast. This is mine. <laughs> <I forget about laughs> Where are that. we? Yeah. Yeah, the, the strat. I, so I have a podcast that's called The Strategy Inside Everything, and that's you were on that. Uh, I think that aired earlier this, in November here. Yeah. Uh, and the goal of that was from writing the book and talking, reaching out to all of those people in strategy and planning and getting to know more people. And, and trying to listen to, to podcasts about marketing, I find most, and I think you agree with this, I think most marketing podcasts are pretty boring. Beyond an episode where there's a topic you're interested in, nobody, that, that it's just not that interesting of a field most of the time. It's all about the guests, and that's great. So I thought, what would make the guests even more interesting than just having guests on? And what kind of conversations do I enjoy, which I know is something that you like to do. It's it's really, I get something out of these. I use them as little uh, anthropological experiments. Yeah. So the point of that show is, let's talk about whatever topic you're passionate about, and we'll break down and get to the strategy inside it or behind it. And that could be everything I've had. Uh, Farah Basta came on and did an awesome job talking about the strategy behind survey design and for the political process. Yeah. I, listened, that was, I thought it was a fantastic conversation. I really like, I really enjoyed that. Oh, cool. Yeah. And she, she blew my mind. Um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later you came on and talked about tabletop gaming and blew my mind again. And I love it. I had a guy on uh, who actually is from Santee who came on and talked about fish, the band uh -huh. and, and how they uh, reward their fans for being loyal. And it, it, I love watching people light up about whatever the topic is. So that show I started in the summertime uh, just because I wanted to have more of those conversations. And if I, I knew if I made it a, a podcast, it would give me, it would force me to go out and find people like you, like finding yeah. you via Twitter and saying, Hey, I want to talk to you um, beyond just saying, Hey, let's get a cup of coffee, which I don't know. People are, people are kind of over yeah, that. That's um, good. And I, and I thought other people might That's get exactly something out of how it too. I started this. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, completely. Just just wanted to meet more people in the business. And, and I'd, hopefully in the next season, uh, I'll be going outside the business too and bringing in some people that just have totally different topics. Which Sounds great. That's the dream, yeah. Perfect. All right, so let's move on to the cool down questions and complete this. Let's so, do it. Uh, talking about ice cream for the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. Uh, and like we got to segue from the previous conversation about food and like it sounds like you probably worked on food and restaurant brands. Oh, yeah. I've worked on a bunch. Yeah. So are there or uh, how would you approach a multi-unit ice cream parlor or is there one that that of that style that you particularly like and think is great from a strategy and branding perspective? Great question. I grew up with Friendly's. Uh, do you know Friendly's? I'm not sure if they have. I don't know. We don't, it's a Northeastern, uh, chain okay. and that, that's a brand I used to really love and I, they're doing some good things now to kind of cut down. They've turned into a, uh, it's an ice cream parlor, but they also have, you know, a full food menu. And like, so when the recession came, everybody started selling everything, everything, their menu sprawled and they've been doing some good things from a 
operation standpoint to cut back food and to limit it and put the focus back on the ice cream and the simple moment around the table. So I, I always think that's smart. Um, I have actually worked on the Cold Stone Creamery brand mm. and we helped uh, put together a strategy for them that turned them, they were in multi-period loss and turned them back into growth mode and then spun them back out so they could start franchising again. So that was a, that's a brand that's kind of close to my heart just because I've, I've worked on it that way. Yeah. Great. And do you have a favorite flavor? Anything with banana, I'm a sucker for. Oh, yeah. I don't know why, but banana flavoring and ice cream, I love it. Yeah. That's great. I was actually was hesitating asking about, are you, are you more for traditional flavors or quite exotic or with a lot of different stuff mixed in? No, I like it. I like it pretty simple. If I put anything in it, it's just something for texture, you know, like nuts or something like fruity pebbles that'll just give it some crunch. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I have two little kids, so I'm exposed to all the garbage, cotton candy and brownie batter and all that stuff. And yes, hey, I don't say no to it, (laughs) but it's not my favorite. Great. Thank you. And you we mentioned briefly that I joined your show to talk about games. And so we, we we talked about that a little bit, but not too much. Um, but I thought now, like, what were the games that you played as a kid that maybe may or may not have influenced you? And yeah, let's start with that one. That's a great question. I don't, I used to play a lot of Risk and a lot of Stratego. Uh, and I also played a lot of Nintendo yes. uh, as well. Those are the three. And then Monopoly. My family always had these epic Monopoly games. Yeah. Uh, and those are the games I played. And I guess those are kind of, they're not hardcore strategy games, but you do have to use your brain. That's not just go fish. You have to be thinking a little bit as you're playing Risk. Otherwise, you get wiped off the board pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in the kind of family where nobody took it easy on me. I'm the baby, uh, but nobody took it easy on me because I was the baby. So I, I that gave me some um, fighting spirit, just getting my butt kicked at Risk by my two older brothers until I could figure out how to... F- move troops from one place to another. Right. And what kind of games do you play with your children now? Or what, what kind of games do you plan on or would you think of introducing? We play a ton of games. We try to do game night uh, at least once a month, sometimes more. And we'll play essentially anything they want to play. We try to play multiple games. There's a game called... Oh, crap. It's a matching game, a card matching game. Okay. And it's, you know, it's the same thing as where you've put a bunch of cards over, but it has a branded name. Uh, we also play chess. We play checkers. You know, we play Chinese checkers, kind of play cool. the classics. But all, any kind of game where they have to apply logic and where four of us can sit around the table and, and spend about an hour together is before somebody has a tantrum uh, is, is really the goal. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the conversation, Adam. This was brilliant. Awesome, man. Thank you for having me. No, my pleasure. So make sure everybody, where they can find you online, you're active on Twitter. What's your Twitter name? Oh, geez. I'm too active on Twitter. That's my <laughs> wife. But I'm at A Pierno, A P I E R N O. Yeah. And your website, where they can find the book on Amazon and wherever. Is there a preferable place to, to find yeah, it? They, no, they can find Amazon's your best place. It has yeah. the, the hardcover, the softcover. And yeah, then, so you I just, guess there's, there's a Kindle, too, I guess. All right. Type in Underthink It, Adam Pierno, or uh, I'll add the links in the show notes. Anything else of the Instill Strategy with the URL? Is it? Yeah, it, instillstrategy.com, and we're going to be moving that just to santi.com in the next, the, the coming months. Okay, cool. And you did something, an event in Chicago uh, where you had people come around and I believe come and get trained or. or there was a presentation. I was wondering if there's anything like that coming up, any public events. We don't have another one coming up. Uh, we did, We Mark and I went to Chicago and put on a, we were there all day. We did four or five different sessions that day. And then the, the culmination was a two hour, well, it ended up being about three hours with mostly young up and coming strategy people. It was called uh, the workout walkabout. We had about 70 to 75 people at that session. And it was just extremely high energy, um, giving people uh, drills or not drills, but, you know, little challenges to work out, asking a lot of questions, good, good conversation. And then we had people just hanging out for another hour after um, asking questions about how to get started in the business. So it was really a great event. We are, we are looking to plan more, but I, I'm going to try to do them in 2018 more as a pop-up style. Mm-hmm. So I travel a lot for work. 
uh, we have clients all over the country and my plan is in 18, if I go to Denver, I'll try to do one in Denver. If I go to Atlanta, I'll try to do one in Atlanta. Great. Fantastic. All right. We'll cut it there. Thank you very much for your time and uh, talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That was really great. Well, I appreciate it. Well, if you're still listening by now, thank you so much for listening to the whole episode. Thank you very much. I hope you appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. As I said at the beginning, it really makes a hell of a difference if you give me some feedback or if you leave a rating or review on I, on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find the show. I take quite a bit of time you know, out of my day and time to do this. Obviously, I enjoy it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. But if you tell me you enjoy it too, and I know some people are listening to it, I mean, people are downloading it. I have the numbers, but I don't really have the sentiment. So that makes a hell of a difference uh, if I have the sentiment. So that's about it. And otherwise, as you know, you can check the rest of my stuff on icecreamforeveryone.net. And you can also sign up to my weekly newsletter, The Ice Cream Sunday. And as I said at the beginning of the episode... We're going to have maybe one more guest or at least one more update to the podcast before Christmas and wrapping up for the year. And I'll be sharing some of my planning for what I'm thinking of for the season three. It's working so far. I just uh, want to put some more work and some more thinking into what are we going to explore in terms of creativity with our guests next year. And, uh, And also, if you have ideas of guests, if you like, if you think of people that you think would be amazing for the show, I'd love to hear from you as well. And that's about it for now, I think. Like, have a fantastic day, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is for you. And uh, I will talk to you next time.